Never did the wonderful genius of Alexander the Great appear to better advantage than when he selected Alexandria as a commercial center and distributing point for the products of three continents, and as an intellectual focus from which Hellenic culture should be transmitted to those countries of Asia and Africa which his victories had opened to Greek civilization. Alexandria was the first city in the ancient world which became the seat of a many-sided, methodical scholarship and of systematic, zealous studies of the exact sciences. It was a university in the modern sense. It also became the great library city of the world. The great library, of inestimable value collected by Ptolemy Philadelphus had been ruthlessly destroyed in the Alexandrian War of Julius Caesar. But Ptolemy Fiskin collected a second valuable library, which was augmented by the splendid library of King Eumenes of Pergamus, and formed by far the grandest collection of books to be found in the world. The great city of the Ptolemies, with a population of nearly a million souls, had also become a sort of neutral territory upon which all religions could meet on equal terms. The cosmopolitan character of this great commercial center, in which Christians, Jews, and pagans of all countries competed for the acquisition of wealth, made it natural for all these different citizens to live in harmony and mutual toleration. However, the time came when Christianity was proclaimed the official state religion under Theodosius the Great. This official declaration became the signal for a brutal persecution of the old religion throughout the empire, and especially in its eastern provinces. Very prominent in this work of persecution and destruction was Theophilus, Archbishop of Alexandria, who was famous far and wide as one of the great lights of the church and as a man of exceptional piety. The main object of his attacks was the great Serapeum, in which immense treasures of gold, silver, and sacred vessels were stored away, and which contained also the great collection of books. It formed a perfect armory of pagan philosophy, religion, and poetry, which was especially obnoxious to him. By misrepresenting the spirit of revolt among the Jews and pagans of the city, he succeeded in getting an edict from the emperor authorizing him to destroy this temple of ancient wisdom and culture, and, for the second time, the magnificent library of Alexandria was partly destroyed, partly scattered to the winds. Theophilus died in the year 412, and was succeeded by his nephew Carillos, better known as Saint Cyril, who continued the vindictive policy which his uncle had inaugurated. It was not long before Cyril had fanaticized the mob against the Jews to such an extent that the latter, driven to despair, took up arms against their aggressors, who had undertaken a regular crusade against their lives and property. At that time there lived at Alexandria a young lady of great talent and renown. Her name was Hypatia. She was the daughter of Theon, a celebrated mathematician who lived at Alexandria, and whose genius for mathematics she seemed to have inherited. She first became his pupil, but soon surpassed him in ability and reputation. She also applied herself with great zeal to the study of the philosophy of Plato, whom she greatly admired and much preferred to Aristotle. Since Alexandria had no professors superior to herself in attainments and learning, Hypatia went to Greece and for several years attended the lectures of the most famous professors of Athens. She then returned to Alexandria, and was immediately invited by the authorities to the chair of philosophy in the university. Hypatia accepted this honor and filled the position with brilliant success. It was not only her profound and extensive learning, embracing the entire compass of the exact sciences, but also the charm of her persuasive and mellifluous eloquence which filled her hearers with admiration. Her reputation as a public lecturer soon equaled her renown as a mathematician and philosopher, and a number of the most distinguished men of Alexandria and other cities were among her regular disciples, listening with delight to her dissertations. One of her most enthusiastic students was Synesius, afterwards Bishop of Ptolemais, who always held her in affectionate reverence, although she had steadily refused to profess the Christian religion. Orestes, the governor, was also among the number of her admirers and was frequently seen at her lectures, which were attended by Christians as well as by pagans. While this eminent woman's celebrity as a thinker would have been sufficient to fill the heart of Cyril with envy and jealousy, there was an additional reason for his hatred and hostility. Orestes, the governor, was a frequent visitor at her house and was known to consult her frequently on important public questions. The archbishop, perhaps justly, attributed to Hypatia's influence the governor's evident leaning toward paganism, and his open admiration for the philosophical doctrines of the Greek philosophers. 
Seeking for a victim on whom to vent his spite against Orestes, he selected Hypatia as the one whose destruction would hurt him most deeply. It was comparatively easy for him to inflame the minds of the ignorant masses with rage against the woman who was represented to them as the implacable enemy of their religion, and whose pernicious teachings had led so many others from the path of virtue and salvation. Everything was carefully but secretly prepared for the fatal blow, which was struck in the month of March 415. It was a beautiful sunny day, and Hypatia got ready to proceed to the university, where she was to lecture that forenoon. A carriage was waiting for her at the door of her residence. When she entered the carriage she was surprised at the unusual number of people filling the street, and at the great number of monks passing through their ranks and apparently haranguing them. All at once she noticed that this great assemblage of people began to move in the direction of her own house. As it came nearer she heard wild exclamations and threats, without comprehending that she was the object of this hostile demonstration. At the head of the procession marched Peter, one of the most fanatical priests of the city. With growing astonishment Hypatia saw them coming, but in the consciousness of her innocence she had no fear. She was soon to be cruelly abused. As soon as the rioters were within a few hundred feet of her residence and saw her seated in her carriage ready to start, the leaders and those in the front rank rushed toward her. Peter was the first to reach her and to lay hands on her. As she recoiled from his touch, others climbed upon the carriage and dragged her down into the street. She resisted and called for help, but her cries died away unheard in the tumult of the roaring and jeering multitude who surrounded the carriage and with ever-increasing violence uttered threats against her. But a few minutes had passed from the moment the procession reached Hypatia's carriage until the infuriated mob, holding the victim firmly in their grasp, had torn the garments from her body and hurried her naked with wild cheers and laughter to the Caesarium, the great Christian church. Paralyzed with fear, unable to utter anything but screams and cries for help, she was dragged, in a state of nudity, through the streets. She was doomed to die, to be sacrificed at a Christian altar, atoning for her unbelief and her pernicious teachings with her life. One of her own friends, like herself adhering to the ancient cult and to Platonic philosophy, fitly compared Hypatia's murder to the sacrifice of a Greek goddess by drunken and infuriated barbarians. But the crowning infamy of this assassination, as brutal as any that history has recorded, was that the victim was dragged to the Church of Christ and slaughtered there amidst the yells and curses of the so-called believers. Hundreds of women had swelled the mob, and like the men they were brandishing flints, shells, and broken pottery, with which to cut and lacerate their victim that they might feast their eyes on her agony. Charles Kingsley has given in his famous novel, Hypatia, a heart-rending description of the last moments of the illustrious woman philosopher. Whither were they dragging her? On into the church itself. Right in front, above the altar, the colossal Christ watching unmoved from wall, his right hand raised to give a blessing. Or is it a curse? Right underneath the great, still Christ. There even those hellhounds paused. She shook herself free from her tormentors, and springing back, rose for one moment to her full height. Indignation in those wide, clear eyes, but not a stain of fear. The fate of Hypatia, one of the greatest minds Egypt has ever produced, shows that not all the martyrs were on the side of Christianity in the early ages of the Christian Church.